Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video, finally. And today's topic is Bucharest, Vlad the Impaler, and the Dragon Bloodline. You might be wondering why I'm on a page about Queen Elizabeth II when I'm going to be talking about Bucharest, Vlad the Impaler, and the Dragon Bloodline. Well, this will be coming up shortly, but first let's start at the beginning. This video was originally only going to be about Bucharest architecture. And at the end, I was going to throw in some architecture from Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. But as I started researching the architecture of Bucharest, I found out some, some very interesting connections that might not seem obvious to some, but when you have a mind like mine that kind of veers off in so many different directions, you'll understand how I got to that point. But since this video was originally supposed to be about Bucharest, I just wanted to go over some of the gorgeous architecture of this beautiful city. So this is in Romania. It is the capital of Romania. And the reason that I found it in the first place, I mean, I obviously knew that it existed, but I didn't know how beautiful it was, was I was watching the show Destination Truth with Josh Gates. And if you don't know what that is, it's a pretty old show, um, probably from 10, 15 years ago, maybe even more. And it's about cryptids. And you might think that my favorite pastime is researching stuff like this. And I really do enjoy it. Cryptids though, are actually probably my favorite thing to research. And I don't get to do it a whole lot for my question, the narrative videos, but yeah, I was watching Destination Truth and they were walking through Bucharest because they were doing one of their investigations there. And as they were walking, I was like, oh my gosh, look at that place. And if you take a look at the buildings that I am clicking on right here, they're absolutely stunning. And most of them are said to have been built around the late 1800s, which is what the narrative seems to be, at least in the U.S. as well, and actually in Australia too. That, that also seems to be a common narrative. And you still have to ask yourself though, how are they building things that look like this with horses and buggies? And we'll get into some of the specific buildings and the timelines that they claim were used to build these buildings. But for now, I just want to look at them and for us to just really appreciate them. I mean, look at this. It's exquisite. So much detail in these buildings. And yes, this does remind me of something that we look at when we're referring to Tartaria or to the buildings that you would see at the World's Fairs. Um, here's an arch, very similar. Speaking of World's Fairs, I believe there was an arch like this at at least one of them. And I certainly, yes, I could definitely see architecture like this being a part of the Millennial Kingdom. If it had already happened, this is what I would expect the buildings to look like if the Millennial Kingdom is indeed, you know, a physical thing and not just spiritual, because I know that some people believe that the Millennial Kingdom, if it did happen, or if it's going to happen, is going to be spiritual. But, you know, we don't know for sure. And when you look at things like this, you can only wonder because we certainly know that we can't believe the narrative that they're giving us about how these buildings were built and how much time it took because it makes absolutely zero sense when it comes to the technology that was available at that time period and just the process of even where do they get the, the supplies? Look at this. Where do they get the supplies? How do they get it there? And then they give such short time spans like two years. So speaking of that, let's just go over to the Bucharest Wikipedia page because I wanted to just take a look at some of the buildings here. And I, one thing that I wanted to show you that I found very interesting about Bucharest is it tells us that 
Bucharest's history alternated periods of development and decline from the early settlements in antiquity until its consolidation as the national capital of Romania late in, in the 19th century. First mentioned as the citadel of Bucharesti in 1459, it became the residence of the ruler of Wallachia, Vlad the Impaler. Remember that because we're going to get back we're going to get back to Vlad the Impaler and you might be knowing what direction I'm headed in with that. But for now, let's just continue on with this architecture. We're going to start out with the Romanian Athenaeum. So, the Romanian Athenaeum was built. It was opened in 1888 and I don't see and hear specifically when it was started. It says that it was inaugurated in 1888, although work continued until 1897. I remember seeing some place that the work started in 1886, but I could, you know, I could be confusing it with a different building, but I can't find specifically when they started it. But yes, this is 1888. And even if the work did continue through 1897, that's only 11 years for this. That's marble. Look at the ceilings. Look at the balconies. The intricate details. This took artistry. Absolutely amazing. I wonder how old these paintings are. This here says 1888. So yeah, and that's when it says the inauguration was for this building. Here is an older photo of it. From 1940, the Romanium Athenaeum. That's it today, lit up. Okay, so next we are going to check out the Palace of Parliament. And this is absolutely huge. And one thing that you will learn about the Palace of Parliament is that it was built in 1984. So almost a hundred years after the building that we just looked at. So let's just take a look at some of these photos. Yes. It's stunning and it's humongous. A massive, massive undertaking. I'm guessing that's probably, oh, Romanian dictator Nikolai, I'm not even gonna try, ordered the building of a colossal structure. So I guess that would be him. And this is it here. There was a whole neighborhood demolished <laughs> to, to erect this. Beautiful, but I gotta say, oh, yikes. I was just going to say not as beautiful as the last one we looked at, but no, this proves me wrong. This is, this is equally stunning. Amazing. Again, built almost a hundred years after the other one and certainly on a much grander scale, much larger than the other building was, but let's just read a little bit about this because I found some interesting things. So, it tells us that the building was designed and supervised by chief architect Anka Petrescu with a team of approximately 700 architects and constructed over a period of 13 years. So it took 13 years from 1984 to 1997 in the 20th century, 13 years to create this. And let's keep in mind that the last one that we looked at was 11 years in uh, 18, in the late 19th century. So anyway, that's not the interesting part really. In modernist neoclassical architectural forms and styles with socialist realism in mind, the palace was ordered by Nikolai Sosescu, the president of communist Romania and the second of two long ruling heads of state in the country since World War II. I'm just going to scroll down here to the part that I have in mind. I always leave links in the description boxes to, to these articles. 
So here it tells us that a contest was held and won by Anka Petrescu, which anyone who has been following the, the World's Fairs or the Crystal Palaces or many of the other beautiful ancient buildings that were told were built in two years time. There are so many times that there are contests held and they are won by what would seem to be nobodies who are, and I'm not saying he was a nobody, but I'm saying that seems to be the narrative that they're just coming out of the woodwork, just designing these grand, beautiful buildings. So a contest was held and won by Anka Petrescu, who was appointed chief architect of the project at the age of 28. That's another thing that you see is that very often the architects of these buildings, of these very grandiose buildings, are usually very, very young. And typically you would think that they would not have had much experience in this. And, you know, hearing that one of them was very young, okay, you know, there are, there are prodigies. But when you see architect after architect after architect for these buildings, and they all seem to be very young. You just ha have to wonder where are they getting the experience to design things like this? The team that coordinated the work was made up of 10 assisting architects, which supervised a further 700. Construction of the palace began on the 25th of June, 1984, and the inauguration of the work was attended by Sosiskiu, who was frequently who also frequently inspected the site. Uranus Hill was leveled and the Uranus Isvor neighborhood was destroyed so the building could be erected. The area had also been home to the National Archives, Mihai Voda Monastery and other monasteries, Brankovenesk Hospital, as well as about 37 old factories and workshops. And the demolition began in 1984. So yes, yeah, so here we have this beautiful building, took 13 years in 1984 to build, and the architect won a contest in order to build it. And as we look at the rest of these buildings, I just want you to keep that 20th century timeline in mind of 13 years when they have the technology and the tools to make work like this go much, much faster. And again, we, we do need to keep in, in mind that that was a very, very, very large building. But I think when we're looking at these, you will understand why I'm so suspicious about the times given. So here we have the Central University Library in Bucharest. Beginning date of this building was in 1891 and the completion was 1893. So two years, to build this library. I mean, I only wish that I had a city or town near me that valued books so much that it would build a library that looked like this. I mean, I don't hear, but again, we have the intricate columns, the, oh, it didn't let me get very close on that. Let me see. Oh yeah, it did. What is this here? I'm just trying to see. Oh, I don't want the people. Let me go back. There we go. I guess it's not going to let me zoom in on that. But regardless, two years in the 1890s, always the 1890s for some reason, those are pivotal years. I'd like to know what this is in the background here. Anyone from Romania in the comments know? I would like to know what that is, just out of curiosity. But this also has some something interesting that I found, something else that you will find in a lot of these narratives of these old world buildings. I'm just going to skim down here because this is what caught my eye. During the Romanian Revolution of 1989, a fire was started in the building and over 500,000 books, along with 3,700 manuscripts, were burned. Starting in April 1990, the building was repaired and modernized, being reopened on the 20th of November 2001. Now, 
I know that a lot of these, especially the Wikipedia articles, will talk about fires happening, but they usually happen around the same time period that they were built. So I'm not saying that this is code for anything, that there was no fire, because it happened in 1989. It's obviously in, within our time period that people will remember this. What I find very interesting is that there were over 500,000 books and 3,700 manuscripts burned. And I immediately think of the library of Alexandria and everything that was lost there. And yeah, now beyond that, wondering what all was lost in this library, let's, let's look at the rebuilding of it too. So they repaired it. And they modernized it, okay? So they started in April of 1990, so just about 100 years after it was originally built. And it was repaired and modernized after the fire, being reopened on the 20th of November, 2001. So the repair and modernization of it took 11 years. In the late 20th, early 21st century, yet... It only took two years to start from bottom up to build this in 1891. I'm sorry, I, I, I take issue with that. So let's go back. Here's the Palace of Justice. And the Palace of Justice was designed by the architects Albert Balu and Eon Minku and built between 1890 and 1895. And the foundation stone was laid by King Carol I of Romania on October 7th, 1890. Again, we've got that 1890 timeline going again. Let's take a look at the Palace of Justice, another absolutely beautiful building. This one's rather large, and it took five years in 1890 to build this. And here we have, this is 1900, so 10 years after it was built, we see, you know, even 10 years later, where these people are at technologically speaking at this point in time and they were able to build this in five years i would love to see pictures of the insides of the inside of this building so this is the last building that i'm going to take a close look at in bucharest today before we move on to the next part this is the cec palace it was built between 1897 and 1900. Okay, again, still within that 1890 timeline, lots of building going on in Bucharest at that time, and yet they're still able to finish everything in relatively, actually very short periods of time. Now, this one was supposedly built on the ruins of a monastery, and that's another, uh, narrative that you will see in many of these old world buildings is that they were built on the ruins of a church or of a monastery or of a temple and this is no different let's just take a look at this beautiful what i would give to do a walking tour that's the monastery to do a walking tour of this area beautiful I often wonder if the people who live here actually appreciate the beauty of where they live. Now, getting into the really interesting part, the, the rabbit trail that I took as I was looking at Bucharest architecture somehow brought me to this. And as a homeschool mom, I can appreciate it because I know that one subject very often to, seems to end up being something almost completely different, but there's always those connections and that's what happened here. So we've, we've got this information here that Bucharest became the residence of the ruler of Wallachia, Vlad the Impaler. And now most people know who Vlad the Impaler is because you've heard of Count Dracula, I'm sure the, the book Dracula. Uh, and that's, you know, that's based on, that's fictional. But you also have this historical aspect of it. He was called Vlad the Impaler for a reason, because that was one of his favorite methods of dealing with the enemy. Now, the reason that I started to think about Vlad the Impaler as I was looking at Bucharest was because I mentioned the, the idea that this architecture may have possibly come from the Millennial Kingdom. And 
people always wonder how could something like that be hidden. Here we have a man, though, named Vlad the Impaler, who is from the Order of the Dragon. And there are ties to the Order of the Dragon being Nephilim bloodline. And that would give them much power. And that would give them the resources to be able to cover up things if they need to. So let's read a little bit about Vlad the Impaler. Again, I'm not going to, to read too much because he's, he's well known. So Vlad the Third, commonly known as Vlad the Impaler or Vlad Dracula, was void of Wallachia three times between 1448 and his death in 1476 and 77. He is often considered one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and he is a national hero of Romania. The name Dracula, which is now primarily known as the name of a vampire, was for centuries known as the sobriquet of Vlad III. Diplomatic reports and popular stories referred to him as Dracula, Dracuglia, or Dracula already in the 15th century. He himself signed his two letters as Drag Dragulia or Draculia in the late 1470s. His name had its origin in the sobriquet of his father, Vlad Dracul, Vlad the Dragon in medieval Romanian who received it after he became a member of the Order of the Dragon. And it tells us here, the Order of the Dragon was a monarchical chivalric order only for selected higher aristocracy and monarchs, founded in 1408 by Sigismund of Luxembourg, who was then King of Hungary and Croatia and later became Holy Roman Emperor. So that is the narrative version of who the Order of the Dragon is. So he he uh, became, his father became a member of the Order of the Dragon. Dracula is the Sl Slavonic genitive form of Dracul, meaning the son of Dracul or the dragon. In modern Romanian, Dracul means the devil, which contributed to Vlad's reputation. The last part that I'm going to read is just the vampire mythology. Again, you can find the rest of this article in the description box. But I trust me, this isn't all that I'm going to be talking about when it comes to, to Vlad. I'm just saying this is the last of this article that I am reading. But let's just read a little bit about this, the vampire mythology of Vlad the Impaler. The stories about Vlad made him the best known medieval ruler of the Romanian lands in Europe. However, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which was published in 1897, again, you got that timeline again, was the first book to make a connection between Dracula and vampirism. Stoker had his attention drawn to the blood-sucking vampires of Romanian folklore by Emily Gerard's article about Transylvanian superstitions, published in 1885, still same timeline. His limited knowledge about the medieval history of Wallachia came from William Wilkinson's book entitled Account of the Principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia with Political Observations Relative to Them. What a title! Published in 1820. Stoker apparently did not know much about Vlad the Impaler, certainly not enough for us to say that Vlad was the inspiration for Count Dracula, according to Elizabeth Miller. For instance, Stoker wrote that Dracula had been of Sicelli origin only because he knew about both Attila the Hun's destructive campaigns and the alleged Hunnic origin of the Sicelis. So, uh, my friend Donita reminded me today that she believes that David Carrico thinks that Vlad Dracul may have actually been a descendant of Attila the Hun. And it certainly says the Hunnic origin of the Sicelis. And if he is part of that, that would make sense. Stoker's main source, Wilkinson, who accepted the reliability of the German stories, described Vlad as a wicked man. Actually, Stoker's working papers for his book contain no references to the historical figure, the name of the character being named in all drafts, but the later ones, Count Wampir, consequently, which I'm assuming means a vampire, 
Consequently, Stoker borrowed the name and scraps of miscellaneous information about the history of Wallachia when writing his book about Count Dracula. So we have the narrative now. We have what the mainstream narrative says about Vlad the Impaler. But let's start talking about the non-mainstream narrative about Vlad the, Vlad the Impaler. Instead of focusing just on Vlad the Impaler, though, let's turn a little bit more and focus on the House of the Dragon or the Dragon Bloodline. And now we're going to get into how I ended up on a website about Queen Elizabeth. Because what we find here is that King Charles III is an actual descendant of, that should be of, in my opinion, the real life Count Dracula. And I've heard this before. That's why I looked it up. That's what it made me think of. But it says King Charles III might be the ruling monarch of the UK, but his royal status isn't his only claim to fame. Alongside his love of Romania, Charles is an actual descendant of Vlad the Impaler, the 15th century Wallachian ruler who was believed to have inspired Bram Stoker's literary vampire Count Dracula. Also known as Vlad Dracula or Vlad III, the warlord's nickname was a result of his favorite method of execution. His vicious tendencies quickly became known in the 1400s, when Vlad was a ruler of the region now known as Romania. Legend has it that he once even used a forest of impaled corpses to shock and deter an invading army from attacking. Whether he did definitely inspire Stoker's Dracula is still up for debate. But one thing we do know is Vlad the Impaler was one sick and violent man. And he's also the great grandfather, 16 times removed of King Charles III. It's not all that surprising that they're related, given that the British royal family's bloodline is easily traced all over Europe. Even the Queen and Prince Philip were third cousins. But 73-year-old Charles has certainly played up to the link, even joking during a visit to Romania. You could say, I have a stake in the country. So, yeah. Further down, it says it was after his first visit to Transylvania in 1998 that he found out about his connection to Vlad the Impaler. I highly doubt that. I highly doubt that. They are so meticulous about their bloodlines. He knew. Okay, I'm going to move on now. A connection that he is very proud of. <laughs> the firm added, because of his involvement in the region, the mayor of the city of Alba Iulia has proposed to grant Prince Charles the title of Prince of Transylvania as recognition for being a prominent ambassador of the Transylvania region all over the world. So, in case you hadn't heard that before, King Charles, Queen Elizabeth II, they're descendants of Vlad the Impaler. And most of you know that all of the royal families are connected. And not even just the, the European royal families. They're also, they also have connections in Africa as well. I, and I actually did talk about that in another video, at, at the very least in Egypt. And so you might be wondering where I'm coming up with the fact that the House of the Dragon or the Dragon Bloodline is Nephilim. And I'm going to get to that right now. I'm going to read some excerpts from Gary Wayne's book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. I haven't read from that from it in a while, but if you've been to my channel before, you know that it's one of my favorite books. And it's so comprehensive that I could never read everything to you here because we would be here for weeks, if not months, going over everything. But this is in the chapter called The Ordo Draconis. It says, why did fairy, Celtic, Welsh, and British kings of history maintain colorful titles of Pendragons, the overlords, Oberons? And why were the original Pendragons not successive heirs, but appointed from purity of Gaelic stock documented by Druidic elders? The respected Druidic leaders carefully chose the originating founding British family from exclusive dragon families selected to be the king of kings in the messianic dragon tradition. 
And when they say messianic dragon tradition, they're not talking about Christ as the Messiah. They are talking about a Nephilim Messiah. And if the name Pendragon same, sounds familiar to you is because King Arthur of the Camelot legend, he was Arthur Pendragon. And this is the, the Pendragon name is not something of legend though. It is an actual name that was used by the royalty. Next, it says, before their downfall, the royal house of Celtic Britain was known as the famous Red Dragon Dynasty of Wales, a remarkable appellation when set alongside the infamous passages from Revelation, portraying Satan to be the Red Dragon. The Red Dragon has surprisingly represented Britons throughout the last 2,000 years, while the army calls their cavalrymen dragoons, a word that historian and author Fergus Fleming says derived from dragon. Arthur's dragon was that of the Sarmatian dragon. Let us now inquire about just who the ancient Sarmatians were. And I should add that I'm not reading the entire chapter to you. I'm kind of skipping around. I'll leave a link in the description to this book in case you would like to get it and read through it yourself. But I'm kind of just skipping around with the relevant parts. But the next part, it says that Sarmatians placed the dragon at the apex of their mystic paragon. While Sarmatian translates literally as lizard people. In antiquity, lizards, snakes, serpents, and dragons were all considered one and the same. We could then, in all likelihood, label the Sarmatians the dragon-serpent people or the dragon-serpent nation. Sarmatians are conceded to have descended from the Aryan race, roaming Nephilim of Atlantis, who held the appearance of vipers, as you will recall. The rise of Roman Christianity and fall of the British pen dragon ended the heady days of the dragon. But the bloodlines recorded continued in secrecy, holding their positions of authority in Europe, Britain, and the Near East, including the Norse and Merovingian Rex de branches. The dragon court was toppled in England after the fall of the Stuart dynasty, which was replaced by the Hanoverian dynasty of Germany that reigns to this day. In Europe, the dragon court remained alive mostly through the Habsburg dynasty of Austria, even though it is still alive in the Luxembourg bloodline and likely the Spanish monarchical bloodline. The Ordo Draconis resides within the infamous Royal House of Stuart and its descendants, as well as in other mystic organizations of Great Britain. Now here, I'm just going to quickly focus on this. There are many, many stories of the British royals being what they call reptilians or lizard people. And there are actually interviews of people who say that they worked for them and saw them transform into these lizard people. I'm not saying one way or the other whether this is true, but it's a fact that people talk about this. People claim to have seen it happen. And now we have this historical information that the bloodline that they come from, the dragon bloodline, is also known as the lizard people. You can't make this stuff up. So the last thing that we read, though, was that the Ordo Draconis resides within the infamous royal house of Stuart and its descendants. Okay, so you might be thinking, all right, well, when you look up Queen Elizabeth the, the second, it will tell you that she is from the house of Windsor, which she is. So are there any connections to the house of Stuart, which is where the Ordo Draconis still lies? Why, yes, there is. Here we have Queen Elizabeth II and Scotland. Her Majesty the Queen was bound to Scotland by ties of ancestry, affection, and duty. She was descended from the Royal House of Stuart on both sides of her family. There you go. So I've talked about this in other videos. They are very, very careful about who is on these, who, who is placed on these thrones, especially in Europe. They all have to come from these specific bloodlines, these specific Nephilim bloodlines.
And they call them by different names. There is the fairy bloodline. There is the elven bloodline. There is the dragon bloodline. But they are all different names for the same thing. These royals are all descendants of the Nephilim. So yes, if you have some very powerful, I'll just say beings, if you have some very powerful beings who are in control over at the very least all of Europe, which again, I believe also down into Egypt, although their power control system is different to my knowledge, I might be wrong on that, but it'd be very, very, very easy for them to hide something like the millennial kingdom and where all of this beautiful architecture comes from. And to be honest, the architecture isn't even that important if the millennial kingdom happened. That's not what's important. But it is a clue that something happened that we are not being told about. So I'm just going to finish up this video with some more reading from this book. It says the under investigated Vlad was the overlord Oberon. Remember Oberon is the term used for the king of the fairies. That's what the word overlord means. That's where they get that from. So moving on, he was the overlord of the old Scythian traditions. He was known to be a fair skin, pale with reddish hair and green eyes, a noble Celt. Vlad was educated in the mystery school of Solomon in Austria. He was an adept of alchemy who was also known to be an adept of the starfire culture, the blood drinking cult of Nephilim. One of the other, and this is me speaking again, one of the other accusations against the British royals was that they drink blood and that they almost can't get enough of it. And here we have stories of Vlad the Impaler their ancestor being part of a blood drinking cult. Anyway, Vlad was affected by sunlight and became a night person or night operative known again, not without coincidence as a night operating opier, which I believe is another word for vampire as in the traditions of Oberon that we have already detailed. Vlad the Opier was known to have had his mystical powers enhanced through the consumption of starfire blood. So that's what they called blood. They called it starfire. So as you can see, this is a bit different than what we got from Wikipedia. It is hardly a surprise then to have had Dracula's Legomen character based almost entirely on Vlad the Impaler, linking him to the immortal blood-sucking vampires of mythology from the night-operating, pale-skinned, blood-drinking Nephilim tradition, all after the pursuit of immortality. Add to the characterization the ferocious fangs of the cobra or serpent, and you have completed the profile of the modern vampire of literature, allegorizing the dragon court and their ancestral links back to Nephilim. That's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work, you can join my YouTube membership. And I hope you all have a great day.